The Supreme Court closed out its term this week, delivering three decisions that will change the course of American society. And in all three cases, the court was split six to three, further highlighting the intense ideological divide between the nine justices currently serving on the bench. One of those cases concerns a Christian web designer named Lori Smith, who was planning to one day, maybe, perhaps, I don't know, possibly, open up her business to uh, we designing web, uh, wedding uh, websites. Let's be clear. She had not done so yet. But when she someday makes those hypothetical wedding websites, she wants the right to refuse service to gay couples on the religious grounds. In her case, to the Supreme Court, she cited one example of a potential client, a man named Stuart, who was requesting a wedding site for himself and someone named Mike. Smith's lawyers alleged Stuart's request came just one day after she filed her initial suit back in 2016. And on Friday, the Supreme Court sided with Smith. Here's where the story takes an odd turn. This past week, as the Supreme Court was deciding the case, reporter Melissa Jira Grant with The New Republic gave Stewart a call to confirm his side of the story. It turns out Melissa's call was the very first time Stewart had heard of the case or Lori Smith. In fact, Stewart is already married to a woman. Stewart told Melissa, quote, I wouldn't want anybody to make a wedding website. I'm married. I have a child. I'm not really sure where that came from, but somebody's using false information in a Supreme Court filing document. So, this case was based purely on the imagination of a would-be Christian web designer. There was no injured party involved, and the Supreme Court still ruled in favor of the web designer. And now, Colorado's anti-discrimination law, law is toast making it easier for religious conservatives to outwardly discriminate against gay people. Joining me now is the reporter who broke this story for the New Republic, Melissa Jarrett Grant. Also joining us is Neil Katyal, Man of the Week, former acting U.S. Solicitor General, MSNBC legal analyst, and this term, he argued and won the landmark Moore v. Harper case before the Supreme Court. Welcome to you both. Uh, Melissa, I'm going to start with you because I just want you to tell us more about what unfolded after you discovered that Stewart, who was listed in the case, wasn't actually a gay man in search of a wedding website. This is a wild case, and thank you for having me on to talk about it. Um, I was actually anxious that after Friday, people would have moved on entirely. Um, Stuart hasn't moved on. We've been texting throughout the weekend. Um, you know, when I called him last week, I fully expected him to say, oh, God, yeah, here's another reporter coming to intrude into my life because of this inquiry that somebody fabricated. Um, because it didn't seem genuine, but I wasn't sure. And that's why I called him. Um, and even before I came across this inquiry in the court filings, the case, as you mentioned, was already built on a fiction. This was an injury that had never happened. This was a person who has never offered this product or service. And this case seems to have been brought by Alliance Defending Freedom, which is a Christian nationalist and anti-LGBTQ law project. They seem to have brought this solely to advance on the arguments they had made in Masterpiece Bake Shop and to create an opening for any anti-discrimination protections for queer and trans people to just be demolished. And they were successful in doing that on a fiction. I just happened to find the most concrete evidence of a fiction. You also noted in your article that Stewart, the, the man Laurie Smith alleged needed a, a website designed for himself, what, is in fact a, a web designer. And this is what he does. So what other interesting details did you find out that just makes this story feel so questionable from the very beginning? Stuart is a really nice guy. I mean, I call a lot of strangers in the course of my job, and he is by far one of the most pleasant ones to be called, given the severity of the information that I was to give him. So just to give him credit for that, he's being very good-natured about being in one of the strangest situations I think a person could find themselves in. You are now included in this landmark Supreme Court case that you didn't know about until three days ago. So, you know, he did say that he had heard of the case, um, last December, not at all anything that was connected to him, but because he's a web designer, 
it was in conversation in the design community, which is a pretty small community. Um, they were sharing the case in the context of like, wow, like our industry is now going to be implicated in what could be an anti-LGBTQ decision. We you know, need to think about how this impacts us. And at the time, he even noted um, no one asked this woman to make a website. And Stuart wouldn't say this, but I'll say this. This woman's websites don't really lead me to believe her past websites that a web designer would hire her. You know, like his, there's a certain level of a suspension of disbelief you have to engage in to think that a web designer in San Francisco would hire a web designer in Colorado who's never even made this product. Um, and Stuart pointed that out to me as well. Like it just doesn't stand up. Like why on earth would he even make this inquiry? Um, and if he were gonna make it falsely, why would he include his own personal information? Uh, we spent a lot of time just puzzling this out on the phone and I'm, grateful for him having such a, you know, good natured response to the whole thing, to be honest. Neil, that, that's the, the key thing here in, in, for me in this case. No one asked her to design a website for a gay couple. Uh, in fact, now we know the individual she's referring to as having approached her is not gay, is married, and again, had not asked her even if he weren't those other things, had not asked her to design a website for him because he's a website designer. This case reeks of the thing that uh, should be concerning to all of us, and that is the consequences of the case of the Supreme Court taking hypothetical cases uh, and, and drawing constitutional uh, law from it. What, what's your yeah, take so there? Yeah, so first of all, First of all, hats off to Melissa for amazing reporting. This kind of shoe leather gritty reporting is exactly what we need more of. And so really it's an amazing story. Um, second, Michael, you're absolutely right. The US Supreme Court uh, is bound. Our founders in Article Three said you have to have an actual case or controversy in order to go to the United States Supreme Court and seek relief. Here, it's a fake case, according to the story. It never, there is no controversy. Uh, this person never wanted to be involved in this in any way, shape, or form. So what I think this means is that the Colorado Attorney General should be going back to the United States Supreme Court now. Uh, it's a tragedy that they didn't find this information out before, but there is a procedure for to seek rehearing and to get this decision stricken from the books. And I think that's what should happen here because, you know, you know, as the current Chief Justice, Chief Justice John Roberts, is such a stickler for policing the case or controversy requirement, and for the most important of reasons. Otherwise, the U.S. Supreme Court can be drawn into any number of controversies that aren't legal cases, but just, you know, imaginary fights between people. And that's not what the court's about. And uh, a little secret, that's part of the plan. Melissa Jarrett Grant, thank you so much for being with us. Neil Katyal, you're not going anywhere, my friend. I got more for you coming up. Uh, we're going to be right back after uh, this quick break uh, with more conversation with Neil. <music> 